Court, and the first thing we do is the Pledge of Allegiance. So you can join us for that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's our turn. Um, so, welcome. This is our middle school update. Our first crew of students is from Ms. C. Camp's, um, Ms. C. Camp's class, and they're going to talk about the great field trips, which I know that you have heard about, but don't know that much about. So they take it away, guys. On September 15th, the whole sixth grade walked down to the Riverside oh. Park. We estimated the length of the, of the different species of fish. Then we measured fish in centimeters. This is important because we are this is important because we are learning about the metric system and signs because scientists use the metric system. We also named learned the name of the fish native to the Hudson River with the American eel. Stark bass, channel catfish, American shad, sturgeon, and the yellow perch. I think this was an awesome learning experience because we got to learn about many types of fish in their average and <coughs> On September 26, we went to the Sioux C- Saw Model Forest where volunteers taught us ha- about our local ecosystem. We got to filter dirty water with dirty water with rocks, cotton, and sand. We got to go on a scavenger hunt, and some of the th- stuff we looked for is a big rock, a bird, and a wild pear. When we got to touch the animal pelts, everyone had to guess which pelts belonged to which animal. This included skulls. One volunteer dissected a flower and showed us the parts of it. When we went to the water station, I had a great fun learning experience, and it was very awesome. We learned where to place your house to not get flooded, and it was a fun hands-on project. On October 19th and 20th, our sixth grade went to Five Rivers to learn all about ponds. We also learned about the life cycles of ponds and how to tell what age they are. My favorite part of this trip was studying amphibians like tadpoles and salamanders. Five (coughs) Five Rivers was really fun. I found seven tadpoles and I named them all after the seven dwarves. My favorite part was when we scooped samples and I found the sound in there. When we netted around in the water, we found a lot of tadpoles in the pond, including some full, full grown frogs. Take it back, kids. Okay? I'm Sullivan McDonald. My name is Jesse Purdy. I'm Claire Viviana. I'm Tasia Alexander. I'm Mason Hubert. And let's give a round of applause to Ms. Seacamp, who... <laughs> you know, starts the year off with three field trips. With that's, that's three terrific. field trips by October... 20th. 20th. So we start the year. So it's a, it's a great start of the year. Looking forward to... Others, Ms. Seacamp? Yes, we have a field trip to the Via Aquarium in Rotterdam, and which we haven't been able to do since before COVID, yes. so that's exciting. And then we do Factor Park, we do the rope course at the end of the year, and then we do one final just walk to McQuaid Park kind of picnic celebration to end sixth grade. Thank you. Very nice. Anybody have any? <coughs> You, you all enjoy your field trips? Is that better than being in class? Yes. <laughs> I always thought so. Oh, oh, I, I should talk about how much they cost. All of these trips cost... Well, not all of them. Well, well not all But these first three trips cost... Yeah, zero dollars. Right. Um, we use Kids Connect, the Kids Connect grant yeah, through right. New York State, and the money's reimbursed, and it makes Mr. Palmer a very happy man. Yeah. I have a question. Were you able to bring home the tadpoles? Or bring the tadpoles? <laughs> or bring the no. Sadly not. Um, Sadly not. Maybe it's kind of good. Right, this is you can. <laughs> well, because part of learning about the pond was respecting the ecosystem leaving the the door, right. and leaving the great and We couldn't even take a rock or a twig. You leave no trace. Right. Nice. Nice. Mm-hmm. Like all the parks. 
Very nice. Thank right. you very much. Do you, do you think you'd like to go back to Five Rivers? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's again fun. and again to see different things and discover different things? Yeah. Yeah. Are there owls still there? Uh, or no? Not they used to have not that we saw. No? Like they, yeah, they had the owl with the one eye. Yeah, they, they saw an owl. Like inside? Like there was a building and there was yes. some closure for yeah. an owl. That must be an old owl because I remember yes. the building. <laughs> How old is it? Oh, no. <laughs> Well, that's terrific. Thank you all. Thank you, Mrs. Sam. Yeah. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Nicole Mutari, and I am the student council secretary. Uh, we are here to represent the middle school student council, camp council, and our co-advisors are Miss Yulia, Mrs. Kelly, and Mr. Frenzy. And they have been doing a wonderful job um, helping us out with all of our fundraisers and providing us all of the materials that we need to make all of this possible. The purpose of student council is to give students an opportunity to develop leadership by organizing and carrying out school activities and service projects. The members of the student council try to foster a sense of school pride and inclusion amongst the student body. In addition to planning events that contribute to school spirit and community welfare, the student council is also the voice of the student body. The student council board is made up of students from fifth to eighth grade, consisting of the fifth and sixth grade um, class representatives, the 7th grade senators, and then the 8th graders running for presidency. Me, Leah Walker, is the current interim president for the 8th grade, or for the student council. Um, but we do have kids running for student council presidents this year, like me and Morgan, Colin and Molly, and a bunch, and many other people. Next one. The Black Hat Carnival is an activity day for the 5th and 6th graders. The carnival has games, prizes, and food. The seventh and eighth grade volunteers or volunteer to help run the games at the Black Hat Carnival, and every fifth and sixth grader gets to participate. So, um, something that we do once a year is the home during homecoming week is the pep rally. So, we, this is the time where we get to appreciate our fall sport athletes, where they get to run through posters and they get their names announced. Something that we decided to do this year is that the 7th and 8th grade band got to play the national anthem at the beginning of the pep rally. The 6th, 7th, and 8th grade chorus sang our Christophe Athens on the monitor, and the student council and fitness club members got to volunteer and run the events and games. And we even got a special visit by our Riverhawk mascot. So. Feed the Eight Families is one of our annual community service events. It provides eight families with food and get certificates for Thanksgiving and the holidays. Student Council makes baskets that are raffled off to raise money. We host a live school-wide <coughs> raffle to broadcast and reveal the winners of the prizes. Last year, each family received a bag of groceries with $265 in gift cards to Walmart, Hanford, Tops, and Stewart's. Stewart's also donated eggs, bread, butter, and milk to each family. And these are some of our prizes, which are also <laughs> displayed in the back, where you can also purchase some no, tickets. No. No. No, no tickets tonight. Oh. No tickets, no tickets right. tonight. Sorry. You can stop by. We'll get you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Isla Busy, and this is Lila. And one of our most popular events in CA are the dances. These dances are the Harvest Dance, Valentine's Day Dance, Spring Dance, and the Last Dance. The dances are a super fun time to hang out with friends, and we collect the donations for the local food pantry as well. Something we do at Student Council is we do a winter activity night. It's fun activities for 5th and 6th graders. 7th and 8th graders volunteer time to help run stations. We have stations like cookie decorating. We have open gym, which includes ping pong and basketball, and overall a good place to hang out. We have karaoke, which was a big hit last year. We have Make Your Own Valentine's, and we even have a movie room where you can get free popcorn. And Oh, 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 sorry. <coughs> we have decorating, um, decorating pictures, and then we have a photo wall where you can take photos as well. The Student Council tries to um, do as many community service projects as we can. We've had food drives, and we recently collected 125 pounds of food 
at the Black Cat Carnival for the food pantry, and food donations are also collected at every dance to make a dan the dances into a community outreach project as well. We have pet drives, where we collect food and blankets for the Columbia Green Humane Society. We have our annual Cunning Wars, which is to raise money for the Deaf Tater Memorial. And we have holiday fun for all students in the middle school. This is where the student council members deliver treats to every student in each grade level to bring cheer to all of the students. We have hot chocolate and candy canes from Santa and his elves, and Valentine's Day treats from Cupid and his offers. That's student council. Colin. Nicole, you did say your name, but you don't have to do yourself. I'm Nicole McCarthy. I'm Colin McElroy. I'm Morgan Bokey. I'm Leo Walker. I'm Alexis Smith. I'm Hudson Meyer. I'm Olivia Christievich. I'm Molly Cooper. I'm Lila Busy. I'm Lila Joe Herdman. And then we have two boys in the back here. Two boys in the back. Come on, They're forward. Fitness. Oh, they're fitness. They're fitness. Okay. 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 Right. When, is, when is your election? Um, our election is November 21st. Oh, okay. Do you campaign for offices? Um, yes, yes, we have um, president for eighth graders um, this year. Vice presidents are seventh graders. We have seventh grade senators, which are representatives of their social studies class. And then we have fifth and sixth grade homeroom representatives, and they also represent in their social studies class. I got to applaud you for all the community service that you do. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen a more active organization as yours with all the activities that you do in the community service, so uh, you need to be applauded for all of that. And this is just a small representation of our student council. Okay. Um, we do have many fifth and sixth graders and seventh graders that join. Um, and it's not just for the officers. Any students that would like to be a part of student council is welcome to come to meetings and volunteer their time or um, do a project with us. So, and we meet every, twice a month. We meet like every, every other, other Wednesday, Wednesday, unless we need to meet, like tomorrow we're gonna meet because we have to decorate for the dance. So like, most of the time it's like every other week, but sometimes we have to have so, so multiple. So you volunteer to be on the council, but you run for the office. Yes, okay. yeah. So anybody that wants to anybody. can be part of the student council, yeah. but we do, because it's supposed to have the student government part, yes. we have presidents, vice yes. presidents, and then every social studies class has a representative oh, nice. who can come back and present to their social studies right. class and get their social studies class's opinions. So it's a representative democracy. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Do you work at all with the high school student government um, or their interact club or anything? The, student, the high school student government has their own yeah. um, awesome. government, so we don't work with them at all. We're aware of what we do, but we try to have like our own like different fundraisers to keep it just mostly for the middle school, so we don't like try to copy everything they do and have like our middle schoolers feel included and it's not like as part of like the whole school thing. It's kind of like make them feel special, like they have something that they're a part of. That's really good. Well. We thank you for coming after school all day and coming talking to us. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, now Fitness Club is going to talk. So our Fitness Club is going to go next. This is a club that we kind of started two years ago, Mrs. Kelly and I. So it's it's it's, our, it's new. It's our baby. Um, and these. Again, it's a very big club, so this is just a small, I think on our last field trip we had 34 kids go with us. We actually sometimes have to like cut it off because we don't have enough space. But this is our fitness club and they're going to tell you a little bit about it and a little bit about what we do. And introduce, why don't you, you two introduce yourselves, the girls already did. So um, I'm Leslie Lawn and this is the fitness club fund. So the purpose of the fitness club is to show students that there's more to fitness than running or just being on a sports team and going to the gym. Our goal is to show students that there are many fun ways to move our bodies and exercise. And I'm Hudson Seacamp. I just joined the fitness club this year and some activities that we do weekly are dodgeball, kickball, wiffle ball, spider, tic-tac-toe, alfonso ball, relay races, hugs. We also help run the event at the middle school pep rally. We do field trips and we're always welcome to new members. Another thing we do in fitness club is we have field trips. That includes Thatcher Park. Thatcher Park 
um, gives us rope courses with two options, and we also have games while we wait for everyone to finish the course and a picnic lunch. We have a 2.5 mile pasture park hike through the Appalachian <laughs> and Escarpment trails. There's waterfalls, caves, nature, cliffs, and while we enjoy the leaf changing season. We play at Visitor Center on the slides and obstacle courses. Okay. We also have a day called Fitness is Fun Day. We walk to McQuaid Park and we have playground time. Then we have a picnic style lunch and we do games and rail and races. And then we walk back to school. Something else that we do is um, we go to Get Air, which is a trampoline park inside of Mall. We get to spend two hours at the trampoline park where we get to we have jump time, trip time, dodgeball games, obstacle courses, ninja courses, and trampoline basketball. So in conclusion, fit fitness club is something where we are able to show that fitness is a lot more than just running around and having to work out and you can actually have fun with fitness instead of having to feel like you're forced. Thank you for listening. Is it after school? When do you meet? Um, we meet like um, on Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. Most Tuesdays are tenth period. Most Tuesdays are tenth period, which is after school. And we meet like twice a month since we're such a big group. Yeah, last year we had to split it up between fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth because there were just so many fifth and sixth graders that wanted to do it. And this group here, they've been with us since we started it in fifth grade, so they're like our up and comers. Mm -hmm. And Satchel Park lot. is another. Um, Kids Connect, Connect. Kid, Connect Kids right. Grant. So we were able to um, go for free, which is awesome. And, and they also fundraise a lot for the field trips so they can supplement the cost to make it low, as low as possible for everybody. And we do, if there's somebody that can't afford it, we always make sure that we have a scholarship so they can go. We would never turn a kid away. And like I said, they do a ton of fundraising. I mean, we had no money and they raised almost two thousand dollars last year for the club so they do a good job we even had leftover money for um the bus this year for yeah. the catcher park that's right we had enough money for the bus good to have leftover money yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now are you what grades are you in uh just this group we are seven to eight seven to eight okay but there's a lot of fifth and sixth. Yes. 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 Because fifth and sixth graders can't do sports. Okay. So yes. fitness club is kind of that outlet for those, them. Those it's, a, it's a good club. It's a good need. Yeah. And yeah. we let them pick the activities mm -hmm. that they do too. So they tell us, you know, we ask, and they play dodgeball every day, but mm -hmm. we ask them, like, what are some of, like, I didn't even know that Alfonso ball was a game. And they all said, well, we want to play Alfonso ball. And I was like, okay, I don't know what that is. <laughs> but, and then we try to find other things. Um, Coach W also works a lot with us to help us set stuff up and use gym equipment. She's been amazing. And they really seem to like it, so. Um, definitely in the past years, we've been able, for one of our fundraisers, fundraisers we do a dodgeball tournament where admission is two to three dollars most years and any and we do grade versus grade and it's process of elimination so fifth and sixth usually go against each other and it's seventh and eighth and we usually do those on two different days during 10th period and then the two winners go against each other and whoever wins they usually get ice cream from the cafeteria for free actually we have a fifth grade member right here that's right, we do. Oh, we do. There she is. <laughs> she was very sad that we didn't have it today because we lost the gym. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I'm surprised I didn't hear anything about any winter sports or any winter activities. Do you think you would branch out into so what we do, so right now we yeah. have two things that we're working on. Do you guys remember what we talked about? Um, snow snow shoes. Shoes. Yeah. So, so we're talking about, we do do the inside one, so we'll, we'll go to get air in this winter, but I'm looking into snow tubing, but the problem is I can't, it's not always during the week. Um, and the other thing that I was going to look into with the grant is I was wondering if there was a way we could do snowshoeing at a park and have it kind of be by the grant and stuff because otherwise we'd have to like rent equipment. So those are the two things we're looking at with with winter sports right now. A few other new things for the middle school this year. We do have an attendance action team that meets um, meets every month. It is made up of people who are interested in helping to improve attendance. 
um, and we look at you know we look at the data we um, come up with different incentives and things so that that team is working on helping to improve our attendance um, our PLPs this year uh, each week the grade level teams have a focus around those kind of core areas um, of attendance, academics, behavior, and SEL. So they are looking at specifically the first week of the month. We're looking at attendance and who, who, who were you know when we started the year. Who were our chronically absent kids? What are we going to do from the start of the year? Who's who's making strides? Who's falling down? You know, um, academics, behavior, and then SEL. So every week there's kind of a different focus. Um, and we've had some other thing. We've been able to bring in some things. Proctors on the go came and visited us a few weeks ago with um, Shakespeare the Remix, which was seventh, eighth, and ninth graders, and it was uh, hip hop and Shakespeare, and it was it was well received. They, they made it interactive. Um, uh, one of our students got to go up on stage and be a character from Twelfth Night. You know, it was it was very cute. It was well received. The kids were phenomenal, well behaved, um, because they're reading Romeo and Juliet in eighth grade. Seventh grade, they did uh, some sonnets, so tried to fit it in with with curriculum. But we also are so lucky to have hip hop, history, and dance workshop coming tomorrow um, from the cultural the Athens Cultural Arts Center is doing a presentation at EJA. They contacted me over the summer and said, "Would you like this at middle school?" And I'm like, "Well, we have this opportunity for Proctors on the Go. Can we do this hip hop? That that's perfect. You know, it's a kind of hip hop's 50." For those of you who didn't know, it's 50 years old. Um, so we are looking forward to that. Mr. Hughes volunteered to bring his classes down and is going to show off his dance moves. So we are very excited about that. Um, as you may know, our students in our special classes go apple picking. So I've included some apple picking photos. That is a tradition every year, but they pick those for the Big Apple Crunch. Um, this year, Ms. Neslin. Uh, also used the Kids Connect grant and took the kids up to Saratoga Battlefield last week, and that was a great trip. And then we're really working on more student recognition. We um, we are we are honoring students who have perfect attendance each quarter. We are not we're not doing big certificates or whatever, but like this quarter because we have the raffle, every kid who had perfect attendance for quarter one got a raffle ticket. You would have thought they won the lottery because they were here every day. And I absolutely, I had one kid come up to me and go, why didn't I get a raffle ticket? I'm like, you must have been absent. He goes, well, I will be here every day for second quarter. So, you know, we're not putting pressure on kids, but just trying to recognize kids who are here every day. But the other recognition is um, Monday is our students of the quarter breakfast, and we are recognizing from each grade two students who demonstrate good effort two students who are high achievers, and also two students who have had improved attendance for each grade. So we're kind of, we're really looking forward to that, and Ms. Stefano and the kitchen staff is gonna put on a nice breakfast with breakfast pizza and fresh fruit and whatnot, and we hope that it's, we hope that it's special, and the kids will all get certificates, and they'll be up on our website and stuff. So those are some of the other updates that don't, that don't involve, well, they involve kids. Any questions? I also would like to point out that one of our volunteers from the Seuss Law, Seuss Law? Is that yeah. Seuss Law Model Forest, who helped the kids um, so filter, filter the water. The water. That's a, I'm like, strain the water? No. Filter the water is here. You know, I was shocked. I'm like, wait, I know that lady. Oh, she's, yes. So she's here. So she was, it was, it was a great trip. I went on that one this year, and it was awesome. regions in the uh, late winter spring at this point. Uh, one of the other recommendations talked about instead of having siloed math and science to kind of look at it as an interdisciplinary uh, approach uh, where kids would maybe not just get an, an algebra credit but get a credit in STEM. It might be an algebra slash science class right, in that regard. So that is a, 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 a big impact on, on how uh, content is taught in classes. That would be a huge shift uh, for schools in the state uh, if that were to occur. So those are a couple. Uh, again, I, I think uh, we're in a good spot here at CA uh, because of that. Uh, because we are uh, working on designing more interdisciplinary courses here at the, at the high school level. 
Uh, we're also concentrating on project-based learning uh, as well, K-12, right, which would be a big part of, of the whole like, concept of competency-based learning, uh, which is demonstrating what you've learned uh, through actions and, and different means as opposed to just, just, just paper and pencil types of tests. So I think we, we're, we're taking the right steps uh, to, uh, when these all come out here in a year, uh, to be ready to help support our students demonstrate what was, what was necessary to be able to graduate uh, from high school under the new requirements uh, when they are when they are finalized uh, for that. So that's, that's a kudos to our staff and teachers and everybody for the work they've been doing uh, in this um, already. So so it, it can potentially be a uh, transformational mo moment for schools in New York State uh, to get rid of the hundred and. 50, 170 year uh, Regents exams as the gatekeeper for, for graduates uh, here in the state. Uh, I'm sure there's people that are bemoaning that, that somehow we're going to lower our standards or uh, and that, and that's, that's not the, 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 uh, the point or the request at all from the state level, but certainly not here at CA. Uh, we're not going to lower our standards or our expectations. The content's the content. We still need kids to know how to do math and read and write, communicate, etc. Uh, but it's just allowing them other opportunities and different ways to demonstrate that, uh, that those skill sets. There's nothing new, uh, this approach. I mean, it's been around for, for decades. Uh, competency based was sometimes called mastery learning back in the day, uh, is, is one example. But there's states that have been doing this for years as well, uh, but haven't relied on, on tests as much for, for that. So uh, it's not something that's going to have to be totally reinvented. Um, to, to make these things happen. It also aligns with, we talked about our, our 2030 destination, it aligns with a lot of our, our look for and what we will see if those things happen uh, at the end of the decade. And I listed a few of them here on this slide uh, for that. Our readiness indicators, college career life ready indicators uh, are a big piece of that. Uh, our standards based reporting uh, that we're talking about, the elementary school is already kind of doing a little bit. We want to talk about that at the secondary level as well as going through a standards based report process as opposed to. Just, uh, percentage grades. Uh, so there's a lot of, of, of possibilities, a lot of uh, innovative possibilities that could take place, not just here at CA, but the schools across the state. So it's, it's kind of going to be an exciting time uh, to be in education right now uh, because of that. So well, stay tuned. Obviously, there'll be a lot more information as the Education Department starts coming up with some proposals to, to turn those recommendations into uh, action steps. Anybody have any questions on that at the moment? Next topic uh, is just capital product communication, and, and Barry brought that up earlier. Uh, just again, we, we uh, went to both PTOs on uh, the village of Kisaki. I did the beginning of the meeting, Barry did the end of the meeting, uh, I guess, that night. Uh, and also the winter sports parents, uh, Kurt showed the video there as well. So we're getting the word out. Upcoming is we have a, a date for town of Athens, one of their meetings upcoming, and we have our parent community council on Monday. So uh, that'll be one of the topics we'll be talking about. Uh, for the parents who come to that as well. On the, on the print or digital media side, uh, the Sleepy Hollow Lake has, has agreed to push some stuff out through their Facebook pages and stuff uh, in that regard. Uh, our website, if you go to it now, before you go anywhere, you see, click here to see the capital project information. <coughs> Facebook will just have some regular updates as you know as we get go through the next couple weeks leading up to the vote. Uh, you may have solved the display board as you walk in the middle school, so each building has a display board in their foyer area. Uh, for parents to see uh, as well. Uh, press release has been sent to Hudson Valley. I can't control whether they publish it or not, but they can, you know, they have it uh, for that to be in the, in the Daily Mail. Uh, and then flyers out of school events, like I said, I did for it, but the newsletter uh, is, will be picked up tomorrow morning and be sent to the post offices. So that should be in people's mailboxes next week. It's also on our website, the newsletter. Again, upcoming, we'll continue to put email push outs to parents just to remind them about the vote and where to find information. Um, parent pickup uh, on election, or on election, on voting day. Uh, we have parent pickups at noon that day. Right, so we'll make sure that they uh, try to get in and vote before they take the kids home. Uh, and there's also a concert that night. Five, six, or seven, eight, one of those. The middle school concert, I know that one of the two greats uh, is that night as well. So we'll make, you know, make sure that they also remind them <coughs> pop over and vote here uh, before they head home that night. So we're going to just continue to you know, provide out the information, accurate information, the talking points that Nicole mentioned. Um, you know, the PTLs was really good about providing some ideas too, how to uh, communicate 
on this out to folks in that regard. And I'll say, kind of piggyback what Cole said with state aid, um, you know, we all pay state taxes, right? And so there's an opportunity to bring over $20 million of our state taxes back into our community. All right, instead of having that go off to, no offense to our downstate friends, but you know, it'd be nice to keep the money up here for a change uh, as well. So uh, you know, that's how the system works. Uh, and so you know, just remind people of that. Just, this is the fiduciary best way to do things, to make improvements to our facilities, uh, is by doing it through a capital project, because the state does pay a huge, uh, in our case, it's 71%, up to 71% of, of the cost of this, this work. So I think it's, it's the smart way to do it, uh, and the board should be commended for it for doing it in this approach as opposed to trying to do little things through the, through the general fund every year. Uh, next time, I just uh, wanted to highlight uh, Food Service Month, Appreciation Month uh, here at Kaksaki Athens. The administrative team will be hosting a luncheon for that. Kind of ironic there, a luncheon for them on Monday. Uh, that's what they wanted. Uh, so we're going to uh, give them lunch for a change. Uh, not Monday, but next. Monday. It's Monday, yeah, it's Monday, that's right, uh, uh, as well uh, for them. So again, uh, they do a wonderful job, as we know, and now, of course, numbers have ticked up a little bit in the last couple of weeks, as Bart mentioned, with free meals for everybody, and they have. Uh, Mary will come back and give us some, some before-after numbers, you know, uh, a couple months after things have settled down, but just even just looking at the lines, mm -hmm. I've seen, in a good way, longer lines uh, in all the cafeterias for breakfast and lunch. And so, your cart, too, they're bringing a cart, is that right? In the high school, she puts a cart right out front. Yeah. Uh, the kids can grab and go all their breakfast uh, right there at the high school. Good. That's what they're doing there, so it's the approach they're taking. So. But got lights for it or something, she was mentioning. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so that's that's been uh, certainly very welcome by everybody. And it, it cost savings for our parents, you know, it's just one less thing that has to come out of their pocket. Uh, I didn't want to just bring this up, uh, I know it's, it's out there moving around a little bit. This is the student surveys. Uh, we, we have two, we have the school climate survey, which we've done several years here, uh, where we do it twice a year. Uh, for, for kids to kind of get feedback and it goes to some of our goals too uh, in, in that regard to get that information and then this year we uh, it's requested between counties and the county as a whole uh, we, we uh, did the prevention needs survey which is just once a year uh, for the even number of grades 6, 8, 10, and 12 uh, for that uh, again and, and again it provides us good information uh, provides us data a, a lot of questions that otherwise can't have that you know no other ways to get that data and how kids are feeling uh, about school and, and in our private survey at least, uh, and, and such as bullying and things like that. Uh, so we can kind of pinpoint a little bit closer as to what our responses should be uh, t towards that. Uh, the prevention needs survey, uh, again, that one's completely anonymous. We don't have any, you know, we gave them a link and that was all we did uh, as far as we gave them a place to take it. Uh, so we have no access as far as you know, we don't know who did it because it's anonymous. Anyway, the only question that's asked on there is what grade they're in, you know, as far as identifiable. So the kids aren't put their name on anything like that. Uh, so we'll get that data back in about six to eight weeks um, from a couple weeks ago. So we'll at least a build like a district wide view of things uh, in that regard. We'll bring that to the board to, to share um, when we get that data, as well as our own school climate data, which we, we do for the third party as well. For that. But I just want to. Again, remind the board it helps us administratively and, and staff to, to guide our work uh, to help kids uh, to what interventions we need to put in and, and also remediation as well. For that, so. Does the Twin Counties one go to all of the grades or is it just the grades that it was currently given to? The Twin Counties is, is they do it every other for every well, they'll give it every year, but it's only for kids in grades six, eight, ten, and twelve. So if I'm an eighth grader today, I won't take I'll take it again when I'm in tenth grade. Does that make sense? Yeah, because I mean, you, you sent us that readers? survey and yeah, some so of those, those questions will, like, I would be uncomfortable answering. Take it again when the 12th maybe. Because it's every three. Oh, Sorry. okay. I, yes. I, I, yeah, I, so they won't take it again. Yeah, this they, group. Won't, they don't take it all then. Again. Yeah. So, like, the sixth graders, they'd be ninth graders in three years, so then they take it as seniors. Maybe. Like, if the starts, if it's every three years, right? Yeah, that works out. Yeah, so it's, I not, so it's not a lot of two, no. No. Okay. All right. I stand corrected. That I didn't realize Sorry. that. So, 
So it's every three years. So it'll come back in three years for that. Okay. Yes. What you missed me say was you sent that to us, that survey, and some of those questions I would be uncomfortable answering as an adult. So we're asking sixth graders to answer some of those questions. Right, and we 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 voiced that uh, to, to the Twin Counties and such. I mean, most of the questions were fine, but some of them it was like mm -hmm. I couldn't believe that we were asking our sixth graders. And I know it's not us asking them, right. but we're still allowing someone right. else yeah. to ask our children that we're protecting some of those questions. Mm -hmm. I was shocked. <clears throat> Especially since the survey thing has come up a few times. Ago. Yeah. <clears throat> and I know, like, we ask our own survey that, like, asks some of those questions, but we try to keep them, like, appropriate. But these ones are more, like, more specific. Yes. Yeah. For, for you know, part of the language. Yeah. So we, we expressed that, and we, you know, we've got feedback from, from parents and such that they thought for sixth grade it was a Maybe not appropriate for sixth grade. Um, you know, the, the response we got back from Twin Counties is, you know, that's the survey is recommended to be used for sixth grade as well. You know, it's the you know for for from the national groups that oversees them. Uh, but as a school district, is that something we can say like, no, we do not want our sixth graders to participate in this and just keep it to the older grades, or is it something that? I, I believe we can. Yes. I'm going to have a conversation because I know uh, Greenville, Casco, and Carol Durham also administered the, the, the survey. So I'm going to talk to them to see if, what their thoughts were on it as well. Just to get for feedback, just to see. Because I know Rensselaer County's been doing it for 10 years, and Hamilton County is kind of like a green county. Just like, but do they give it to, I mean, it would be good to know, like, what grades do they give it to? Yep. Do they give it to all of the grades that they're recommending to, or yep. do they? And this survey's done every three years? Yes, that's right. That's right. Yes, I thought it was on every two, every three years. And, and, if, and if the school board looked at the survey before it came out and decided certain questions they did not want to be asked a certain, a certain grade level, could those questions be eliminated? I can, I can ask them that. I don't know. I don't know if it's possible. It does. It's not their not Twin County survey either. I mean, I just, you know what I mean? It's, it's, a, it's a national survey that's, that's used. Right, but where's our control in that? The, just say yes or no. We just we just say we're not going to get the survey. Like, or we could mo more. or we could modify the survey if the questions weren't we didn't the school board didn't think they were appropriate, right? I, we can ask. If we can I, do I, think I think it's more of a generic. These are the 125 questions, and you either I ask all 125 or you don't do it. Is what I would think when I would look yeah. at that paper because it's very. The, the, well, we we, we, yeah. we need to ask the question if we yeah. can modify it for for. What school board thinks is appropriate. Well, there's a website. If you look at the at the bottom of the survey, is the company that puts it out, and they're in Utah. So I looked at their website, and it says they don't want you to do that because they say that they put a lot of a, a lot of the questions build on each other and right. they kind of fit together, and then they get a they get a, a kind of a, a, a way that they look at the data. But, so, so I guess what we have to look at as a school board, once the data comes back, is is this something we want to participate in if, if, if a lot of members of the community have uh, some difficulty with it? Yeah, I, I, I think it was, it, the way it struck me, and I don't know, maybe, maybe we knew it was happening or coming, but I didn't know it was coming. I didn't know that the survey was going to be done. So your October 12th updates. Was it in the updates? So what, not the sample of survey, because I didn't have it yet either. Okay, so I, I think, and this is just me, but if I, I would like to see me serve the surveys that we're, that we're using. And, uh, and then if this is from another agency, um, then I guess they're asking us to do this, they're asking to, or to, to yes allow them to do the survey with our kids to be, and then it's not identifiable, so the data will be an aggregate data. Uh, however, I, I too was concerned about some of the questions because there's no, some of those questions you almost ask in a therapeutic setting. 
because based on the answers, you may, uh, a clinician may have a response, you know, t that they then have to do, you know? It, it could like drive treatment. So I, I worry that some of the, they're so open-ended, and then we don't know who the kids are, so we can't, if, if we get- Well, that's not true, because okay. a friend of mine, their son, was messing around on the survey, and he was called out on it, so they do know who it is. Yeah. So. Well, I guess I, I said that because my worry is, and if we get 16, it's not anonymous, right? correct. Yeah, but if we get 16 kids that write back, and we don't know who they are, that they're thinking about harming themselves, mm -hmm. I, and we don't know who they are. We, we we can't direct resources. So I, I just worry, what, what do we do with that? Right. I mean, we it, it's almost, you can get into like universal precautions, so we, we just have, you know, efforts, which again goes into bullying and, and uh, mentoring and efforts to help kids feel good about themselves and better about and having uh, allies and all the things that we're doing, but, uh, it certainly would drive a lot of my own thinking if I had seen this survey before it was given. So then I wonder, and not that it gets dangerous because I want to micromanage, but we do get asked then, you know, by many people individually, what are we doing? So I think I'd like to personally like to know when, the, when a survey of district, you know, all these wide surveys are going to be uh, initiated and then we have a discussion, I think, even about surveys. That's just, so, just So should it come as a topic of the board agenda, just so we talk about it as a group as opposed yeah. to being sent out as a message? Yeah. And I even wondered, is this a presentation? Like, why do we do surveys? What are we looking for? What do we do with the information? Really, that's the chief thing. If when we find out things, what do we do with it? How does that drive the interventions we put in place? And does it change anything? You know, so it just, it, 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 it starts us thinking, all of us thinking about, you know, how, how we're taking care of kids. So it just and I, it just as I start thinking about it, like maybe we maybe we need to look spend a little more time on this topic around. I mean, surveys are often how you find out things, I guess, but and, and you gather data and and, and it drives your interventions. But what you want to know is that does it really drive your interventions? So does the data that is collected, where in our goals? Uh, do we indicate that they are there because of the data that we collected? That's. And we seem to have this conversation every year about our surveys, but we've never really delved into what you're talking about. Yeah. So maybe we need to start doing that yeah. and figure out what is appropriate to be asking. Because you're right, Tara, some of those questions. As an adult, I wouldn't so have the answer. As part of that, do we have speakers come in and present to us? I think that, board that might be where that, that goes. Or a workshop? Like, or? Uh, this, the company that created this survey is in Utah, and, uh, but there are companies that do this, so it's like, what, and, and, they, and they set up their questions. Your question's a good one, like, what, can we kind of craft it? And then, but then it gets a little proprietary because they have, it's a copyrighted survey, probably, and so you probably can't do a lot of, it's like, plays, you know, we can't change the lines in a play. So it's like, they've, if they've copyrighted their survey, we probably can't do a lot of change. But then, what goes into it? What you want to know, like, yeah, who's creating it? Are they experts in the field that they're telling us they are? You know, All right. what's their background? Right, and, and again, we, we can, we can even talk, I know that this survey was recommended by the New York State Office of Addiction Services and Support, so, you know, so we can, Sure they reach out to them if they'd like to talk about the survey. Yeah, I, I know that might be, be the ones betting. That might be things. good because when I went on the website, there was nothing newer than like 2006. 
and they mentioned several states, and New York was one of them, but not, not how it was used, and not how their surveys are used. Right. This I just wanted to uh, give out a couple of kudos. Uh, EJ A PTO, uh, who uh, had their Thanksgiving feast today. It's always a wonderful uh, celebration event down there uh, for the kids and everybody. And I just wanted to give a shout out to them. Uh, this is the fall winter season athletes, uh, kind of in transition right now. Uh, and I know it can be a hard time on kids and the parents uh, as well, as far as back and forth and practices and such like that. And just want to Give kudos out to them, and also to all of our uh, fall all-county music participants, uh, choir and band. They uh, recently were uh, performed at the all-county events there in the fall. So I want to give them a shout out as well. I'm just going to stand over here just because I'm going to be pointing out a few things on the board. So I'm going to start tonight very similar to how I did the ELA data with you, but we also have Dr. Fanning is here to get into a little bit more information on the specific math program. So just to start, um, just to start off with, this is and this is why I separated the two out because I think it makes it clear. Just a reminder, the spring math program is an intervention program. It's not a curriculum. So when we're looking at the ELA pilots that we're doing, there we're looking at curriculum to cover grade level material. This is really a program that is looking to provide interventions to close gaps for students who have below grade level um, gaps. So I just put that in everybody's mind because we'll talk about things a little bit differently when we're looking at this data. So to start off with, ooh, it came out a little blurry. Um, and you can, you have this in your, in your um, packets electronically, but if you need a copy, let me know. But um, this is just how our kids are doing um, on A math or early math, so similar to the A reading and the um, early reading for the ELA pilots, you'll see following along with the cohorts. So this is obviously all last year's data. So when you look over here, so 66% of our kindergartners were on um, grade level or above in early math, and that went down to in first grade here, it was 67%. So again, you just kind of follow the colors along and that's how you how the kids are in terms of a cohort. So that's the same kids. So the kids in this group are the kids in this group. Okay. And you can take some time and look through it. It's gonna be a lot of data I'm gonna throw at you. So then similar to how we did the ELA pilots, we took a look at how did the kids do um, the fall of last year, the end of last year, and the beginning of this year. You'll see our color codes. So SM stands for spring math. No SM stands for no spring math. So I made this one a little bit clearer. I wanted you to see. So this is kids who were kindergartners last year. So this is their kindergarten data here and here. And then fall of 23, they're now in first grade. So what this is showing you is the green is kids who are at or above. And then the yellow is you know, yellow and kind of orange there. Those are the kids who are at some risk. So they're, they're kind of, I call them your cusp kids. And then the red, either the dark, dark red or the brighter red, are the kids at high risk. So this just kind of shows you where the kids who, who had the different programs, because some kids had spring math last year and some kids did not, how they fell. So I look at this two different ways. So one, obviously you can compare bars to each other to see spring math versus non-spring math in a particular category. But then I also like to look and say, okay, starting out in the fall of last year, we had this many kids who were at high risk um, and they received spring math for the year and now we have no kids in the high risk category from that group. So that's another way that we look at it and you'll be able to see numbers as you go through. So, Carrie, Carrie, I have a question. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a little confused by this. So the red, the red and the red are kindergarten and first grade. Is that why we have two reds? Two different no, kind of reds? It's, so the, this red is spring math and this red is for kids who did not have spring math. 
The kids were in kindergarten last year. These are the same exact kids, but they were in kindergarten last year, and now they've started first grade here. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. So nobody in first grade has spring now? Or, right, for the fall? No, so right now, nobody who had spring math last year ended up in the high risk category. <laughs> it's a lot of colors and a lot of, that's why I always say, I give you the, the big overview and then you can ask me whatever questions you want to after you kind of di diagnose it, or not diagnose, digest it, that's the word I was looking for, um, over the next couple of days. Right. So, just to slow it down a little more. So if, if you come here, so this is our first graders. So this group of first graders had spring math last year, and this group of first graders had spring math last year. Okay? And that's compared to this group of kids who did not, and this group of kids who did not. Does that make sense? What, what does it tell you, Karen? What you want. That's what you want. That's what you want to find it. The, the percentages is the percentage of kids on grade level in, in the different areas. Uh, percentages of kids in a different area who had it or didn't. Wait, uh, sorry, now I have two questions. So, uh, can you ask me your question again, Mike? What is it telling you? Like, the, the, the green bars mm -hmm. is telling us what? It's telling us this is of the kids who fell in the area, the percentage that um, either had spring math or did not have spring math. So you had two groups of kids. Either they did it or they didn't. Correct. Okay. So the so one set of red, half of them had, the other half didn't. Yellow, orange, half had, half didn't. Correct me if I'm wrong, Harry. Yep. Green, half had, half didn't. Or well, no, the one not. color had it, the other color did not. Yes. Yeah. The, yeah, the darker colors. colors. How do you split it up? Yeah, the darker colors had spring math, the lighter colors did not. <laughs> oh, that's a really good way of putting it. Is, Tom, is, Tom, is Tom made the picture. Is that grade? Like, who are those kids? These are the kids who were in kindergarten last year who are now in first grade this year. Of, of all, both buildings, our entire, entire kindergarten, kindergarten to, first to first grade population. And the reason that some kids had spring math and some did not was because it was a pilot that some teachers were using and others were not. Yes. And of that entire population, what is the percentage that was receiving spring math? Entire population receiving spring math and not receiving spring math. Here we go. There we go. So this is where you get to, this is uh, a few slides in. So these are the actual number of kids. So the kids who had spring math, kindergarten, who are now in first grade, because again, that took out anybody who was ours for kindergarten but is not here with us now. That was 21 uh, students, and 36 students did not have spring math. And what's the oh, red, so yellow? This is so hard to interpret. Much better than the I always like that as we as we get further and we look at the data from last year. I always like bars of uh, I like uh, charts versus uh, the bars and because the red, I yellow, green, green. It, it indicates what. So the red it goes back to those colors from before. Red is always for anything in fast bridge. The kids who are in the red that's high risk. So those are your kids that are performing significantly below grade level. Yellow you kind of look at it as a stoplight. So your yellow is your kids, you're, they're slowing, they're not quite on target okay. to, to where they need to be, but, but they're moving faster than your kids who are quote unquote stopped. And then your green are your kids who are um, on or above okay. grade level. So this chart may be a lot easier to look at and I can change this into percentages and make a chart that has percentages in it if you would like to have me do that, that would be easy. I'm looking at Tara's face. I She's can't a, read a single one of those numbers. It's a lot of <laughs> no, it's just too far away. Oh. <laughs> so, um, so this might be the the better way. But Tom does it in in five million different ways for me, and then I try to pick the one that makes the most sense to me. But I could also have Tom come to a meeting too and explain how he comes arrives at the data. We like having a data guru because he he can show it to me. He had line graphs. He had all sorts of things, but. 
the charts kind of made the most sense to me. So just so you know, so that, that's how each of them are, are created. So when it says four dash fifth, what that is referring to is those were the kids who had it in fourth grade and are now up in fifth grade. And then again, this is the same data in terms of specific numbers of kids. Last year's data was compiled um, at the end of the year as well. These were the ones that you remember from when I did the ELA pilot. It's the same concept that Tom did. And again, I like these better. I find them easier to look at. So this is the kids. Now this is the data not from how they started this year, but how they ended last year. So the kindergartners from last year at the end of the year, um, sorry, that's actually the winter growth. So this is the spring growth, and you'll see down at the bottom, it'll say which it is, so just to end the year. So for the spring growth, at the end of the year, 74.1% of the kids um, scored higher than a 50th percentile for growth, um, and 43.2% of the students who did not have spring math um, scored above the 50th percentile for growth. And again, this will give you the numbers. So I like these charts. So if you want me to, Tom didn't make this specific chart for me for this past fall, but if this chart is the easiest way for everyone to understand the information, I'd be happy to get Tom to make these kind of charts. For that. Terry, when you say one group had spring math, the other did not have spring math, you're saying that one group did not pilot a certain Correct. math curriculum? Again, this is not curriculum, this is an intervention program. So you look at it this way, these students had spring math, which Erica's gonna get into what exactly that entails for spring math, but these students had a specific intervention program to work on facts fluency um, that was spring math. These students also had an intervention program that worked on facts fluency, but that's gonna be um, out of FastBridge. So kids got intervention if they needed intervention in mathematics. Yeah, the, the big difference between um, our intervention programs is that spring math is what's referred to as a tier one intervention. You give it to all the kids. And then there's certain kids who get additional spring math support, but all the kids get some level of intervention. For FastBridge, it's really the kids who get identified as needing support get you know cover, copy, compare interventions, different types of things that come out of FastBridge. And the goal here with this data is what? So we're, we're trying to figure out if spring math is going to be an intervention program that'll help us really move our kids forward. We haven't seen the growth with the fast bridge interventions that we would like to see. So we're piloting the spring math to try and see if, if that will close what seems to be a fact fluency gap that our kids have. So one of the big complaints up at the middle school is that the kids, because they can't quickly computate, they are not able to do the demands that Somebody's not on there. The demands that even the middle school curriculum has for them, and it gets even worse when they go up to the high school. So one of the big things that everyone kept saying is, is there any way to get the kids not only understanding how to add, subtract, multiply, divide, but do it in a quicker fashion? Because when you get up to, say, algebra, even in fifth grade or sixth grade, you've got to be able to kind of work your way through a problem in a, in a set amount of time. And if you're still trying to count on your fingers to get you know, a basic uh, multiplication problem done, that's a problem. So when will we have the data needed to make those decisions you just indicated? So spring math decision is going to be the end of the year. So we'll take a look at how the data went last year. We've had a lot of other teachers jump onto the pilot because they felt like the, the fluency was really coming along with the kids. We struggled a bit, which you'll see in the data, with the kids in the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade area. Um, and really, the struggle there was just that it took them a long time to work their way through their skills. And that was because the you know, when you get up to that level, when you really, we had to go back to subtraction in fifth grade, and, and that was something that was shocking, and it took a while to kind of fix those gaps because they had been created so long ago. The kids had these strategies that really weren't helping them, but they were very married to at that point. So it was a lot of reteaching and, and helping out. But at the younger grade levels, it seems at least right now to be really helping the kids move forward. But again, we'll, we'll see how the data goes at the end of the year. So two steps. So first, 
come March, we have to figure out ELA, and then come, come um, the end of the school year, June. But again, this is an intervention program. This is not our math curriculum. Our math curriculum still stays the math modules, at least for right now, from the state. Right. So, and you can go through all these graphs um, at any point in time, and if you've got any questions, I'm happy to, uh, to answer any of those. Again, this is just all of last year's data, so Tom broke it down. So you can see, if you want to, how the kids went from fall to winter, but then also how they went from fall to spring by each, by each grade level. All right. I'm going to turn it over to Erica. So most of you recognize me, usually I'm here to talk about restorative practices and social emotional stuff at school, but I did my doctorate on um, matching student skill levels to interventions to um, build math back fluency. I wrote 363 pages about multiplication. So what that really means is I know a lot about RTI and math intervention. So this is, um, this is kind of actually my, my big passion. So. Um, essentially, spring, spring math was built on the learning hierarchy, which was a theory that was established in the 70s. And essentially it means that in the beginning when we're learning something, it takes us a little bit. We need someone to show us how to do it. We need someone to immediately correct our mistakes so that we're not practicing our mistakes over and over again and, and learning the wrong answer. So when students are in the acquisition stage, they need a high level of intervention that has immediate feedback. Spring Math lets you do that with a whole class because you partner students together to do that for one another. They check each other's work as you go, and that allows that acquisition piece of learning. The next stage is the fluency stage. So now they can do the task accurately, but they don't have that rapid recall. So we were talking about fact fluency. Like imagine trying to reduce fractions if you don't automatically know that eight is a factor of 56, right? So if you don't see that right away, everything you do is gonna be harder. There's cognitive theory that goes into this. It's, you know, 300 pages. So we need to do this fluency piece. What you'll see with our data is that we teach the skills but we don't take the time to teach to mastery, which is when kids can use those skills to apply them to more complex tasks. So being able to take the multiplication and learn the fractions, or to be able to learn the fractions and do, the and do word problems and things like that. You need to learn the skills to be able to use them for something else. So, uh, Spring Math, um, the people who created it used some statistics that are fancier than I know how to do. And they, use, they chose skills at each stage of the year that predict proficiency in algebra. Because algebra predicts whether or not we graduate high school, and being in remedial math means that it's gonna be really hard for us to do math in college. So it's kind of like a gateway in terms of math. And so even in kindergarten, we know if kids can do these skills at these times of the year, we can pretty accu accurately predict future success. That's how this whole program was built. So this is examples of kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and you can see the first one here, grade level, count objects to 10 circle answers. This is one of our current kindergartens. This is what we see when we go into the system, and what they've done is create hundreds of skill chains. So you can see the prerequisite skills required to get where you need to go. So you can see the first skill for kindergarten is that count objects to 10 circle answer, which was the first benchmark skill. So they're immediately jumping into grade level content. So you would expect to see more growth in kindergarten than you would later on because kids fall further behind as they're in school longer, right? Kindergarten is the beginning. So this class here is already at their mid-year goal. When kids move through the intervention, you get <coughs> with the grade level skill. I bet you got pointed at that one. There we go. You start to see graphs that look like this on your growth tab. So for this class, at the start of the year, 20% of the kids could count objects to 10 and circle the answer. By the time the class moved through to the class-wide intervention, 91% of the class could do it. The same goes on as you go through the skills. So you can see that yellow bar is the same skill as the red, and then the blue is the spring benchmark. Now, this is last year's data, actually, for kindergarten. And, and just to jump in, so the whole class takes it, but then, so if you look at that 91%, it doesn't mean that those 9% of kids, we just ignore, those 9% of kids get flagged, and they're the ones that get pulled out to have a separate 
mm -hmm. additional intervention on top of that. So the whole, yeah, the whole idea of RTI is that you can't pull 50, 60 percent of your kids out of the classroom to teach them skills. You have to be able to teach that many kids in the classroom. It's just not feasible for schools to have that many grown-ups, and we know it's not good for kids to come out of the classroom. So if you can address a skill that most of the kids need and everyone benefits from, the way to do it is tier one. And Spring Math allows you to do that. The other thing it does is, if all the kids are responding and all the scores are going up, great, keep going. But what you'll see over time is that some kids will start to fall below. And that's when they get flagged for the interventions. It's actually a more accurate way of predicting who is not going to be successful than a single benchmark assessment. Um, and it lets us really see who is struggling. They chose um, a class median has to make it, and that's what's seen well, uh, here, there's an instructional target and a mastery target. Kids have to get to the instructional target to be on that success track, but they have the class median be the mastery because that predicts most kids in the class will fall up into that range. So it's all mathematically, and they're always making changes to make sure that it's accurate, and their benchmark for needing individual intervention is very low. They really want to capture anyone who might need it. And once you're in intervention, they really require you to build your skills up because they don't want you to fall down again. So this was last year. One of our kindergartens, they were able to get through all the skills. So you can see that yellow to red jump. And then the blue to red is the, the interventions they did as well. So for example, the second area here, identify number, draw circles 1 to 20, 9% could do it, and then 100% could do it by the time they were through their, their intervention. And so these scores are wrong. I emailed Spring Math today because I had a whole bunch more slides to show you, but luckily we're running too long anyway, so I don't. But um, it was actually 100% and 92% of the kids who made it. Those are wrong. I don't know what that is. So two of the skills everybody in the class could do. These two, only one student could not, and he had, he had health issues. He, was, he missed a lot of class. So I say this is successful. Um, and I think that's why we see some of those fast bridge gains for the first graders this fall. That's where we see the most growth, because these kids, they got through it. Um, this was our most successful. I'm going to show you that. Um, and, but the other kindergarten class did very well as well. And we have successes throughout. I just, you know, I only have so much time. So this is what a fifth or sixth grade thing um, would look like. And what's exciting for me is that, you know, everyone's like, oh, you did your dissertation in math, but I don't know anything past back fluency. So it was never helpful if it got beyond that. And it's really important to do more. And this is the only program I found that applies that learning hierarchy with um, discrete assessments and inter uh, evidence-based interventions for specific skills. And the problem with math compared to reading is that for reading, you know, your goal is to read. But for math, there's so many different skills that are not necessarily linked. There is no general outcome measure that can measure overall math ability. So the fact that you're looking at these specific skills and you can target exactly what these kids need, I just, it, it makes me really happy. Um, so I'm just going to point to these first two fifth grade here. Fact families multiply to five, <laughs> zero to 12, and add and subtract decimals to hundredths. Now we're going to look at the skill chain for fifth grade. You start with sums to 20, and then subtraction to 9. You don't get to a grade level skill until the fifth skill in your chain. So you're not going to see that growth on the growth tab. You're not going to see as much growth in fast bridge, because you're still building those skills that the students should have had before they came to fifth grade. So it takes a little longer the older the kids get, but that doesn't mean that we give up. So. These kiddos last year, um, no, this is this year. Oh, what I can tell you, this is also really exciting. So this year, they're here on Division 0 to 12. Last year, this time of year, this same teacher had her students on the third skill. So they are now all the way down here. If they continue, they might even make it to their mid-year goal on time, whereas last year, we never made it there. So it takes time to build these skills over years. They say you won't see the growth on your benchmark until the third year of implementation, especially for the older grades. So this is what it looks like. This class has only gotten to one um, grade level skill so far. And they went from 32 to 88% of them being able to do it. And I can tell you two kids were just flagged in that class last week. Can I ask so, a question real quick yeah. about this? So it's not an intervention. I mean, it is an intervention, yes. but it's like, it's um, you take like, if it's in my 
42 minute nap period. I'm taking 10, 15 minutes to do spring nap and it's, everybody's doing the same thing. So this is during our win time, which is our math intervention time, or we use our intervention time for that is in addition okay. to the 42 minutes of math instruction. Okay, so everybody's doing the same thing? Yes. Yep, and then until they can't. And then they get, you drill, you drill down and then that drills all the way down to wherever that student needs to be and then it's either individual or small group intervention and they get that until they are successful. So does every fifth grader get wind time? Yes. Except, well there are like two or three exceptions for specialized reading or things like that mm -hmm. occasionally but yeah. everybody else, yes. And then at the elementary level it's a separate, there's a spring math time, a 20 minute, it's a 20 minute program. So it's a separate time uh, in addition to their mathematic core instruction. Daily? So that, that is what, so we collect data to really get down to it. Spring math it does say it should be done daily. So we're doing some analysis. The teachers are giving us scores that they're getting with the frequency that they're able to do it. So we're analyzing that to look at does it have to be five days a week? Can we still see growth with three days a week? So that's a piece of what it is that we're looking at. As a person who's always done intervention stuff, construction, what are you doing with the kids that are, like, so, you're saying that this whole entire class is doing the same skills. What about the kids that have already mastered that? Are you, how are you enriching them? Because it's sort of like, you know what I mean? Yes, so it's, they are, um, part of it is that they are helping with the, um, the tutoring, because it's a peer tutoring thing, so they are models, it helps build a lot of things, and there's a bunch of benefits, and I believe there's an article or two in here that will answer it more better than I, I can, because I'm still learning. Um, but also, the teachers do give them extra problems to complete, to continue to build it, and they do give them stuff, so if they finish in the allotted like two minute time, they, they have more to do. And usually, now that, well, you'll see, I'll show you. Um, so, how do I know this is working? Okay, so last year, it took second grade an average of 13 and a half weeks to master subtraction zero to nine. It took sixth grade almost seven weeks to get through zero to nine. So we really ran into some of that trouble you're talking about where there were some kids way at the top for a long time, really bored. Teachers were frustrated. We were frustrated. Teachers were really upset because kids weren't getting flagged for individual intervention even though they were lower than the other kids. But that was because the whole class still needed the same intervention. They weren't falling below their class. The whole class wasn't there. And we really did see a big divide. But this year, all of the fifth grade got through this skill in one to three weeks. And so, and there were, most of them was less than two. So it was just a quick practice and everybody was through it. And now we've gone from working on the same skill for, you know, I mean, this was great. They, I don't know, they did some magic in third grade last year. But um, now, if you can see, Spring Math recommends about four weeks per skill. We are down there, I mean, at grade five, we're rocking and rolling. Um, and so now we're down to an average of four weeks. So in one year, we've half the amount of time it's taken to, to, to learn those basic skills um, because those kids had that practice the year before. So they're coming in higher um, and they're moving through the skills quicker. So average numbers of weeks to master skills. So that was just subtraction zero to nine. This is overall. So you can see last year, anything red is above that four. I mean, I gave 4.15 green because it's right there. Um, but you can see we're doing much better this year. Um, you know, five is still, or grade one is still not quite to four, but they did half the number of weeks that they were at, and they are way ahead of where they were last year. Um, and grade three is a little behind, but they started late last year, so they are also ahead of where they were. Um, and so it also depends on, you know, how many kids were getting it last year and, and things like that, right? So all of first grade was getting it last year, but only half of kindergarten. So sometimes that might play a role too. And you're right, someone was talking about the numbers and the different sections and looking, trying to compare the fast bridge scores of the two groups is really, it's going to be difficult because the numbers are so different. So how much further along are they? This is so exciting. So <laughs> we have 22 teachers who have data for both years. And of the 22, 18 are um, ahead of where they were last year. And up in the middle school, we have a few who are way ahead of where they were last year. So they have that skill chain that I showed you before um, on the side of the classified intervention. 
And this is if they were in one of 18 last year, and this year they're on two of 18, there's nine of them who are full skill ahead. There's three who are two full skills ahead, and then up here we have one rock star who's six, six ahead. So this, the kids are moving faster through them. They're getting these skills sooner. The estimated are teachers who didn't do spring math last year, um, but I looked at the other scores for the same grade, and if they were consistent, I said, OK, so all of the other, for, I don't know what grades these teachers are in. I did that on purpose. But um, you know, all of these kids are in grade two were on the second skill at this time last year, but these teachers are already on skill four. So it's not comparing them to themselves, but to the teachers at their grade level. So everyone is ahead except for a few at the bottom. And I can tell you three of these teachers are not doing spring math this year. Um, and one is the teacher who made it all the way through, so she didn't need to improve. So, so they're, they're ahead by using <coughs> spring math yep. as an intervention? Well, hopefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many factors in education, right? Maybe they have, you know, a different cohort of students. Maybe they're an amazing teacher. Maybe, I mean, who knows? But these teachers are compared to themselves. So uh, this, I admire that you're so... <laughs> I've never seen data like this in 10 years that I've been trying to do work like this. <laughs> but, but does it mean that there are so, so other, is there a cohort of kids who are not getting spring math as an intervention? Or is everybody getting spring math? Today? At this point, we only have three teachers not doing spring math this year. Um, they requested to remain being the, the group of, of kids to compare against. Uh, everybody else for this year is doing it. Um, it's not the only places that there were full cohorts where everybody did spring math was first grade last year and fifth and sixth grade up um, in, the, in the middle. So as a social worker who did do well in math, <laughs> but is there a point where you, you don't wait till the end of the year because your data shows that it's working for so many kids that the kids who are not doing it, do we do them a disservice by not instituting it sooner than next September? This well, was a, right was now, a, it, it is a good wonder, and we did put something in place in case we got to, to that place, which is that the teachers not doing spring math, our progress, they're using other interventions, but their progress monitoring their kids with the short spring math probes, which you can kind of think of like a mad, mad minute. That's what we had when we were little. So they're still using those. So if at any point in time, they're like, you know what, my kids are not moving and everybody else's kids are moving, I want to pull them in. They'll already have had the practice with doing the, the probes and be able to, to slide in fairly easily. I think that the difficulty when you're, when you're looking at this, I think we have some clear data because it's an intervention program that says that they're moving up in skills. Where it's harder to look at is how are they doing curriculum wise? Because again, this is just one piece of the curriculum, having the skill set to be able to access the rest of the curriculum. So that's going to take, as Eric would say, longer for us to see the benefit there. Um, but I do think the teachers in general are saying we're closing skill gaps, which is the important part of an intervention program. You know, the question is going to be, which is what we're still looking at, are we closing them faster than we did with spring math? Early data says yes, but um, but we'll we'll really get analyzing that one. The data, data you showed earlier showed a pretty definite difference. In, in, it's, in, it's it's spotty up and down with the with the fast bridge data. When you look at the fast bridge data, it looked better in the early grade levels than it yeah, did it K, in the K in the later one. grade levels. But a piece of that is fast bridge is looking at the benchmark of this is where we want all the kids, not the specific skills underneath. Mm -hmm. And this really was doing fluency last year because that's really all of our kids could that's where they were at when they were doing the um working their way through the program and getting stuck on sums to sums to nine do you still see some catch up from the pandemic like kids are still or are they pretty much no i think there's there's still catch up i think mm -hmm. what's happening is and erica put it very succinctly is some of our kids probably because they were home and trying to figure out how to do certain skills, they picked up some bad habits. And, and this program really helps us yeah, kind of get that. rid of those bad habits because you can think that a kid is doing really well and understands you know, subtraction, but then you find out the manner in which they're, they're doing it is onerous and time consuming. And then their inability to understand subtraction becomes a problem later on. 
So like touch math is something that we've used and you know research has shown it doesn't help improve that fluency, it doesn't generalize and it's slowing kids down and I'm actually seeing it now. And so like things we thought were good and that a lot of people were using everywhere, we're finding out really weren't getting the kids to the mastery levels they need to be at, which, which this does help us do. Um, and I love that it was the math coach's idea to still continue to assess the teachers who aren't using spring math using the same assessments so that we really are comparing apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. Can I ask a couple of questions before we go? So there's three teachers total elementary middle school who are not using it this year. So is that one from each building? They are all actually in one building. So there's a, a second grade teacher and two third grade teachers. In one building. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And then what number of teachers were not using it last year? Mm -hmm. So 29. Let's see. Sorry, it's not on. Um, or how many teachers were using it last year? Which. And what is 22? <laughs> 22 teachers were using it last year. Yeah. Okay. And how many teachers are there total in elementary and middle school? That's what I was trying to remember because I know so one of them is. 4, 8, 15, 10. So add 4, 8, 15, 10. Let's see how, let's see how your math skills are. 37. 37. I'm going to trust him. So 37. 37. Total. That doesn't match. No, that doesn't match. Math teacher. Come on, math teacher. Oh, oh, I added your well, number to write you. Yeah. 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 So 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 all right. So you look like 21. So there's four teachers from the fifth grade. There's four. There are you. Yeah, that happens when our fifth grade teachers are either on the estimator than number. I think it's 29, no? They are all doing spring math, so they're all down to dinner. Yes. I don't know. I hope my numbers aren't wrong. Right. They could be. Four. So oh, maybe you, do that you count all four fifth grade te what? teachers? Five five grade eight. Eight. Four, so and then 15. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Am I missing? 25K four teachers. Wow, I didn't know my question plus, was going. Plus yeah. eight. No, now I'm like, who am I missing? I'm definitely <laughs> missing seven. 33. 33. Oh, but I'm gonna like add oh, this. Give me the one. You said four, eight is 12, plus 10 is 22, I plus 15 is 30. I'll double check it right. and I'll get back to you. It's, it's, I believe it's 34. Okay, okay. 15. So, so then the last so piece of that, if we like ever seven. come up with that number, <laughs> we will. So, the students in the three classrooms not using this, Carrie, pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, stop distracting you. Just move. Those students may or may not have been getting it last year. Yes. So how do we read this data? I mean, how do we really believe in this data? So, I'm, well, I'm now sorry, that my I'm numbers are totals to are wrong, I'm not sure how I believe this one. But what I will tell you is all the teachers I included, they're further along than they were. And to me, the most telling, honestly, is this one. I mean, you cannot argue with those those numbers. But that's the same teacher. It's not the same cohort of students. No, that's all of the second graders, all of the third graders, all of the fourth graders, all of the fifth graders. Those are those those are the grades where they do this skill where I had scores for this skill. So last year, let me go ahead and So this year's third graders took 13 and a half weeks to do a skill in 2022 with second graders, right? Or is that so this year's third graders took four weeks. This okay, so you did it straight across. 4.4. Okay. But yeah, what you, you do have to consider is, like you said, not all the fourth graders got it last year, third graders got it last year. And um, but your 20, what he's asking is the 2022 call. Mm -hmm. If you go, we'll take the third grade with the asterisk. Those That's are those are the third graders from 2022. No, those are these guys. Okay, so, so it does that's come what he's down. Asking. So it's a cohort. Yep. The so if you're looking level. at grade two here, 13 weeks this week, this year took them six. That's what I meant. Yeah. Yep. yep. The four to four. That's what I figured you meant. Seven to 1.5. So, so this year's fifth graders and fourth graders it took up seven and a half weeks. But it's different. Scale. But it's a work, different, isn't it? Right. It's yeah. a different right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's still so the same skill, the same intervention. Fluency skills for that grade level. 
Oh, they didn't both change. Just so you guys all know, if you're looking at my face, I can't see it. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. This is what I'm looking at. I can't see it at all. What colors? What colors? You said red. I'm sorry. I didn't realize they were both updating. Okay, I can see everybody now. That happened for about 30 seconds. Oh, we're looking at now. We're looking at now. Sorry. I'm leaving. Four on that chart. So. There's no way to have a perfect study in education unless we, we bring some researchers down from U Albany, and I'm happy to do it. They're already helping. So, you yeah, know, no, like. I understand that. But, well, but, yeah, I mean, just trying to get through this study is. It's a lot. It's a lot. But it's a lot. A lot. It, it is, this is. This is really exciting. <laughs> I have watched kids struggle with subtraction for years without ever achieving the scores that we are seeing. Not even coming close. So, so look at that chart and see if I can be assumed, I hate to assume, that right now kids are getting through twice as many skills as they were last year. Yes. Because they're eight last year. Oh, yeah. And the kids who got through the year of skills in this kindergarten met benchmark on FastBridge. Yes. The kids in fifth grade didn't make it that far because we have more to make up. And so by them having it, most of the fourth graders had it last year. So now they're coming into fifth grade with those skills. They're moving much faster through the sequences. They're going to get further. The score should start to go up. Yeah. I mean, it takes time, though. You know, right. we can't make up for the loss in a year or even two. Um, but we are closing. I believe we are closing the gap with what I'm seeing. I've never seen anything like it before, so I would stand up here and lie to you. <laughs> um, average, so same. We're getting through the skills much faster this year. Um, and it's interesting when you think about it cohort-wise, because I wasn't thinking of it that way. Um, so first grade, but look at this. So first grade last year was like 10 weeks, and now they're down to four. That's huge. Eight to five is pretty good. So that one is a little bit. Six to 1.8 is huge. And four to 2.7. I mean, those are big differences in rate of, rate of improvement. I mean, those are weeks. That's how much further ahead they are. We're going to start to see that. And what happened last year is once fifth grade and sixth grade got through the basic skills and took forever to do the first ones, they really start to move quickly. And that's it. So we'll be back in, you know, whatever time, winter, whenever you want me. <laughs> I'll show you some more. And I do, I didn't mean to have some handouts, but I didn't have a ton of time to prepare. So I do have, if you're interested, you can email me. I have um, the skill chains and the benchmark assessments for all the grade levels if you want to see them. Um, and some research articles on all of this. Um, and uh, they just actually published another article in Educators Weekly, I think. Um, a school in Brooklyn is now at like, went from like 40 to 90% proficient on their benchmark assessments and state assessments. So, um, so when will 7th and 8th grade teachers give you feedback on the programs you're doing? So 7th and 8th grade, we're only using it in WIN right now, um, which is not ideal. It's well, when these kids move up. When the kids right. mm -hmm. He's talking about how they're, how oh, how they're going. Oh, how they're going? Yeah. That skills they're, there's going to be their work right. overall. We're going to be doing, I know we just talked about surveys, but a different kind of survey, just, just for adults. Um, we're going to be surveying the teachers um, after the winter, um, so it's like middle to end of January, the winter FastBridge um, universal screening assessment. So we'll be doing that because they'll have that data plus obviously how the kids are doing in class. So the teachers will be filling out surveys then and they'll do it again at the end of the year as part of the process to help us figure out if it's a full adoption or not. And we'll, we'll, we'll hear something. And obviously, we hit you with an absolute ton of data. Somebody's a little bit more excited by data than I am. But please let me know like, if, if you want us to cut this down and say, I really like just the chart with the numbers of kids that I find that easiest to digest. Because I know it takes me a little while when Tom gives it to me in like 15 different ways. And then I have time to sit with him and talk through which one makes the most sense to me. But just because it makes the most sense to me doesn't necessarily it's mean it's the really easiest what, way what for you. Your experiences are, and the, cut it into like the outcomes. And when you talked about it's three, uh, you know, however many weeks it was here, and now it's 
one tenth of that. Those that kind of things of were in, I'm interested in because it's, <laughs> it's a significant change. That's what you look for, significant change. If it's minuscule, then it's, why would we, but there's right. significant change. So then I worry like, well, why, why are we waiting to not, to do it for kids that are not doing it? But that's another, that's another thought. But as far as hearing it, to me, it's like, you boil down where you, how you think it's effective and if it's working, and then show it. And then I have a question. If we decide to go with this, do we have all the teachers do it? They can't opt out of using it? Okay. Yep. It'll become our intervention program. So okay. that's but then all the teachers have to use it. I think they're going to want to. I think by the time we get to the winter, we're going to see so much growth. I, I think people are going to be excited. I really do. Yeah, I, I think the only hesitance that really existed coming into the fall was just we didn't have the data about how quickly people were able, had the difference now between how quickly that people are able to get through things. I think there was concern at the end of the last year how long it took initially in some of the upper grades for kids to get through a skill. And now we're seeing obviously they're starting to move faster and I think that was one of the big stumbling blocks for certain people. And I will say that, you know, we all want to fix it immediately, right? Because that's where educators, that's what we want to do. But when we talk to the spring math coaches, they tell us we're ahead of the game for early implementation, that we have more teachers doing it than they typically see, that we're making faster growth than they typically see. Well, maybe they're just trying to sell us the program, but I don't think so. <laughs> um, I think we are, you know, Jackie and Becky really worked hard last year to get people up and running, and without them, we couldn't have done it. Um, and so I think I, I think it's a lot of testament to their work and to the teachers' willingness and you know scheduling time to make it happen in the schedule because like you said taking 15 minutes that's why we're not doing the seventh and eighth grade we we didn't have the period to give to to that time so so we'll see I'm excited I think I'm gonna be even happier next time I see you <laughs> thank you very much. Up here, uh, free meals. So it's been brought up a couple times tonight. Uh, November kicked off our first free month of meals for our students for all breakfast and for our lunches. Uh, we saw the breakfast cart come back, the meals in the morning for all the kids. Um, we are seeing increases, obviously, in our usage for the food service department. And I just have to praise Mary Di Stefano a ton for her quick, speedy efforts and not only assisting in getting these. Um, the application submitted but following up with um, Ellie over at uh, Child Nutrition and also working with Heartland to get our uh, computer modules in a cafeteria set for free meals so I, I did just want to throw uh, Mary a big thank you from really from all of us because I, I saw the emails coming through so I, and I really know she appreciated those um, evacuation drill, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of um, October, we completed an evacuation drill down in um, Athens at EJA, and then we did a separate one uh, two days later up here on the main campus, um, where we went to the churches at this location, and we went to the firehouse at EJA. Um, in both cases, we had a pre-meeting, a pre-evacuation meeting, and then afterwards we had a post-meeting just to see what we can do better um, for our students and just making sure we get from point A to point B safely, and then obviously returning as well. Kind of project financing, uh, I put that together uh, a couple weeks, or probably about a week ago. Uh, it's up on the website right now, just wanted to turn your attention to it. Um, it was, it's also in the presentation that was provided to the public last night. It's really just showing a quick snapshot of how we're going about financing and paying for the capital project. Um, if you have any questions on it, please just feel free to email me. If there's anything that you feel could be added or taken away, uh, please let me know. Yearbooks. Um, we have a ton of yearbooks, and I thank Andrea for helping get through it all with me. Uh, we took a big inventory of all the extra yearbooks that are in the district office right now. Um, we're keeping one copy of every year we have, uh, just to have for historical purposes in the district office. We're gonna keep them there, but all the extras are listed on here, on this, uh, the attached uh, worksheet there in board docs. Uh, that will also be on our website that we'll put up there as well. 
folks can call the district office, come and take one. Um, we're just trying to really free up some space because we don't need 40 copies of the 1972 yearbook, even though I heard that year was awesome. Uh, we had our first person come in today to get some. I know, I heard they took like five of them. You should have done a buy one, get one for each. Shelly doesn't have her senior yearbook. Well, Shelly should come in and get her senior, junior, sophomore, all of the above. <laughs> what what was, year she will put it off to side? I want to say 83. Mm -hmm. I'm not I sure though. Ask her. Send her an email. Just, I, I am not calling her and ask her what year she graduated high school. <laughs> <laughs> um, so while we were meeting with uh, Mike and Jamie going over the agenda review, it was requested, as some of you had also requested when I met with you back uh, a while back now and did our one-on-ones, to have us further explain the financial reports that you approve every month. Um, Kelsey and I are going to put together a presentation, uh, Kelsey's our district treasurer, and we're going to come to the January meeting and do a very, I don't want to say brief in the sense that we're going to rush through it, but a very direct, like, this is what this means, this is what this means, just so you guys understand what it is. And one of the things that we'd also like to do is, um, in the maybe not the July meeting because there's a lot going on that day, but in the August meeting, sometime over the summer when... Uh, if there was turnover in the board is give that same presentation again just so we're all on the same page good refresher for those returners as well middle school library where we're currently sitting right now uh, we put an RFP out it came back uh, last Friday <clears throat> we were looking to redo the floor in here um, just bring it up to life and get rid of this disgusting carpet uh, we have the quote is later on in the um, in this agenda to be approved. We'll be paying for that with um, art, art money, so it's not coming out of our general fund budget. I think the amount was around twenty-eight thousand uh, dollars. Zeph once again was the highest bidder of the three. I did include all three bids. Lowest. 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 Sorry, that's what I meant. Let's go to the highest bidder. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, got it. Um, so Zeph was the lowest bidder. Thank you. Uh, of the three that I, I had included in there for you guys to look at, and um, we're looking to have this done not right away because we also, with the art money, finished up the library bookcase replacement order. And so, all of the bookcases in here that you see that are wooden are being replaced with bookcases like this so that we can move them. Um, the mobility of those, we'll get all the books on the shelves, and then we'll come in and do the floor because. Otherwise, we'll be moving the bookcases twice, and that just sounds dumb. Any questions on that? All right, cool. Uh, I had a 25-page, these are my notes from a conference that I just went to. Kelsey and I went to the ASMO conference up in Saratoga. It was awesome, a lot of good stuff. Uh, some stuff was directly school business related. Other stuff was just us learning about new facets of what other schools are doing. It was great. Uh, a lot of good people had a lot of great conversations. And as Bart alluded to, yes, other people pay for the food. And it tastes that so much better when it's free. Um, I went to a restaurant I would never go to on my own. Just say that. And so uh, I, d I did not attach it because I thought 25 pages would be a bit overwhelming. In addition to, we don't have all of our notes in the same uh, document yet. So we want to just kind of put that together and, and send it out to you. Um, but it was very good. I did sing karaoke this time. Well, that's unfortunate. Oh, God, it was. I was so upset. But getting late in my old age. All right, any questions for me? All right, cool.